I'm Jen Bush, I'm the entertainment editor for Fan Voice. I'm here with Craig Van Sickle and Stephen Long Mitchell, the creators of The Pretender. So since, it, since it's a little quiet because there's everyone stuck downstairs, let's start this completely differently than most panels and let you guys ask questions. You want to stand up or we just... I'll just talk. Yeah. yeah. Totally. We're all family. We're all family. I just, um, for myself, I wanted to, to thank you for a show that Taken in its total, it was very unique, and I think it's influenced many shows since, oh, by my opinion, um, various aspects of it. But I'm curious what shows you think may have been influenced by uh, The Pretender uh, that are maybe current or recent shows that you can see maybe some of your influence in. You know, that's a really good question. Um, let's put it this way. Alias, we thought, in some ways, had, a, had an influence because it was kind of the Miss Parker story. Um, or, and, and you know what? There was, a, there was also a show by uh, <clears throat> Glenn Gordon Carone. I can't think of the name of it, but it lasted. Do you remember the, the show with Dennis Haysburg? It, it had a lot of pretender influences, and it came out, I want to say, a couple of years after we went off. And I cannot remember the name of it, but it was about a guy who had been. Did they have the same in. guy? They had the same uh, Petruvian man? They may have. They, they yes, may have. <laughs> you know, and then I think obviously Kyle X Y I think had some. Yeah. You know, and and actually one of the guys who was one of our writers went over and they brought him in to kind of figure out the second season of Kyle X Y and he kind of said, "Well, I told him we'll just do the pretenderings. You know, go, go for it. <laughs> you know, but you know, so I, maybe we influenced or maybe just in the zeitgeist things kind of changed because I think before we were doing the pretender. Most shows were whole and complete, but there weren't a lot of mysteries. Right, and that's, I think that was one of the biggest influences. Shows like the, like John Doe. Yeah, like, John Doe. Um, yeah. Even some of the shows now that, that utilize flashbacks, I think, owe a lot to you oh. and how you did for the expansive um, plot, kind of funnel shape, whereas you got into the show, the plot, the overall plot, all the subplots kind of widened and brought in a lot of information. Well, what we try, one thing we tried to do, in a, as opposed to, say, Lost, which, you know, I, yes, what it, is. <laughs> it was what it was. I love a show that is intriguing, but if you have to put down, this was from episode three, and it was about the, you know, the squirrel who came in with the snowman. It's like, it's real confusing. Going back to the original um, concept of The Pretender, when we wrote it, it was a spec script. And when we, NBC read it, we said, oh, we love it, we love it. But, to answer all these questions, we'll put it on the air. And we said, well, if we answer all these questions, there's no reason to put it on the air. Literally, we said that. And we said, you know, you can keep your money. And they were freaked out because television up until then had been about making sure those questions were answered. Right. right. And the fact that we didn't answer them is probably the reason a lot of you are here today because you want those answers still. And because we got canceled because of the XFL, there were a lot of answers that weren't given. But Craig and I love this show and never gave up and wanted to basically recreate it in a way where we can give those answers and bring it out for a whole new audience. Well, one of the best compliments we got was when uh, Warren Littlefield told us that the testing, they weren't sure how to test our show because it didn't fit any particular right. category. And then later they actually used the pretender test as a category. criteria as a category. They tested us as a an X-Files-like show and as a touch by an angel show because they didn't know what it was. Right. And then the next year it was a pretender-like show. <laughs> which is, you know, and our testing ended up being, um, probably the reason we got in there because NBC didn't understand it. Right, right. But it tested higher than anything since Bonanza. Right. That was the whole thing. They were blown away. Yes? Um, I wonder, in today's TV landscape where the actual TV live viewer or even just TV viewer in general has gone down, the pretender's ratings you know, when it was originally on, are so much higher than the hits, you know, on NBC now. Do you think if The Pretender, like the original concept, was on TV now, it would either would do the same numbers or even be like a huge hit as opposed to... Well, like, I think it would be a huge hit. What do you mean? Well, you know, like, <laughs> like, 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 or like if it wouldn't, get, the word. <laughs> if it wouldn't get, like, canceled, because, I mean, it got canceled because the ratings were low, but now the low ratings would be for well, NBC, yeah, like... Spectacular. And it was also on the lowest rated night of the week. Saturday was yeah, the, when they, yeah. the dead zone, and they, and they don't even program Saturday night, a lot of the networks. 
because of that. And that's why I think they threw the XFL on too, to try to just do something. Giving. Who's, who's ahead in the XFL standing? Does anybody? <laughs> oh, that's right. It's gone. Yeah, but to kind of follow up on what you're saying, it's like, we don't know. I mean, but there was something about the show that appealed to a real cross section of America as opposed to so much television right now is geared strictly to the urban markets. And that's really what they wanted. And they didn't quite, when we were saying the testing, they didn't understand why it tested so well and why really in mid America it was a huge hit because it was, you could watch it, it was intriguing, but also you could watch it with your kids. And that's the thing that now that the book's out and people are are writing to us, there's this thing of, you know, I used to, it was a great thing. There was an article that Jenna, about Jenna doing the comic book or the graphic novel. And the, the author of the article, he started with, you know, when I was growing up, I was like a gangbanger, and I don't know, it was a gangbanger. He was like, I'm a tough guy, drank a lot of stuff. My brother was a, a nerd. My father and mother were, you know, white trash. Or, I don't know, I'm really glorifying myself to people this morning. But basically, the thing was, we had absolutely nothing in common except at 8 o'clock on Saturday night when we all watched down, sat down and watched the same show. And that was like one of the more interesting things to look at going like, okay, that was the one thing that bound them together as a family, which for us is really bizarre to see those kind of things. And we get letters about that all the time. It's like, you know, my father, my mother, my grandmother, we all wait and watch this. And it's like, that's, there's, some, there's not a lot of shows on that that do, does that anymore. Definitely not. Everything is now like niche. Like you've got each, everybody has their own shows. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, and then anymore when you go out to sell a TV show, you, you have probably 10 different pitches of the same show depending upon who you're going to pitch it to network and whatnot so yeah but it, it's just to follow up with Steve said we, we've been blessed with this show because we have gotten so many nice uh, letters feedback from fans that that really say that the show touched their lives and that to us is is uh, really the impetus to come back and do more um, there are a lot of reasons but uh, the fact that we got so many nice life-affirming letters from people it spurred us on to, to, to really keep on the track yeah, and bring, bring it back. So, thank you all for that. Um, I just wanted to say, well, one thank you for posting us. I didn't even know what Kamikaze was until you guys said you were going to be here. Um, <laughs> and then. Uh, Neither did we. Jenna <laughs> <laughs> did. Yeah. Well, and then I wanted to ask you, maybe planning to cover this later, but I'm still unclear on how much of this is going to be reboot and how much of it's going to be continuation. And whether or not we're going to, it's been 10 years, and I still want to know what happens after Island of the Haunted. Uh, the answer is yes. I was like, yes. Um, some of it is reboot. Some of what we've done is we've rebooted it in a way that contemporizes the character. So in the original show, he was captured in 1963 and escaped in 96, I guess. In the books, he was captured in 83 and escaped now. And the reason we did that is we wanted to, it's, and it's the same characters, Miss Parker and Jared and Sydney, and basically everyone will be back. But the, the thought process was we wanted to allow people to remember some of what we had done and also to invite in a new audience where they'd be reading a, a book and continuing the story with a contemporary character as opposed to a guy who's 55 running around being chased by this woman who they're all in love. Um, but within this, what we've done is we've given tons more backstory into all of those characters. So some of the questions you've always wanted to know are being answered in the reboot right off the bat. In the second book, we establish a character whose um, goal in life is to find out what Miss Parker's first name is. <laughs> we reveal what Sydney's last name is because we never had done that. And so in every book, we're going to start answering those questions, but within a new drama. So. In many ways, it would be like watching, I don't want to say Star Trek The New Generation, but something like that, or, or no, a reboot of Star Trek. You know, it's the same characters, but now a lot of the questions that we already wanted, you're going to get in a modern version of the story. So, it was funny because when we sent it out to a few super fans uh, before we even released it, they were all very nervous. And then uh, some of the comments back were great, where it's like, you bastards. I can't believe you did it this way. And then we, once we realized what you were doing, they couldn't believe it. Because even in the in the first book, we take literally some homages from the pilot itself. It's not the same story, but 
key um, similarities. There's similarities where you can sit there and if you're a big fan, you'd be like, oh wow, I can't believe you did that. And if you've never seen it, you can sit there and you're like, oh wow, I can't believe this guy's doing this. So it was really kind of a conscious approach to do that. And, and you know, it was, it's and really- we will answer your questions. Yeah, we will answer your questions. But it was, it was a conscious kind of re-education too, because we know that there are a lot of people out there that may not know the series, remember it, whatnot. And, and I think you can read this book if you're totally novice. And I get what a pretender does, and I get where Bitch Miss Parker is, and you know, yes, yes, and uh, or and if you're a fan, you but you get all the nuance that you remember from the series and brought forward. So it, it was a bit of a of a tightrope act, honestly. We we talked about the story and the characters a long time. And trust us, you know more, a lot more about the series than we do. Because you'll ask us questions, and we'll be like, ah, who should talk about? Yeah. Oh well, as you'll probably see when we. Yeah, moving. One other thing, kind of to segue a little bit into the graphic novel, which I don't know if you guys know this, but Jenna is actually writing the graphic novel, and and we'll, before you, when we all leave, I'm gonna give you all a card where you can actually go um, link on it, see the first. It's the ten page, ten page preview, yeah. which is great. But it's all about the origin of the center, and all those questions that people have are like, well, where did it come from? How did it do? What? We're gonna do this in a whole. Um, parallel storyline where it's like we're going to fill in everything about the past and little Miss Parker's in that so we're going to see it from her point of view and then as you know we'll, we'll announce this I guess at some point but we're going to do a series of other books that are going to come out some are about Miss Parker and her teenage years and her early 20s learning to become an operative if you will and see the and see the, 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 the arc of her change from a preteen to the Miss Parker that she grew into and why and, and that was a that was a rich character uh, territory that we never got to explore in the series. So. Exactly. In the pilot, there's that line where Sydney goes, you were such a nice little girl, what happened to you? And we thought, let's show how she got from being a nice little girl to the woman we meet in the pilot who's held up to get him. And within that, we're going to do part of that is her going back to France and learning that's where the training was and kind of retracing the steps of her mother as a child. So we're learning a lot more about Catherine Parker. So. We're doing this in a way where everything we're doing is somehow tied together in a way that really answers those questions without it just being, because we thought, okay, let's just do a book that's right after Island of the Haunted. But if we did that, and, and first it'd be an encyclopedia of answers, but it also would come out in a way where you'd go like, okay, really? Okay, so what's the next book? Or does the story end now? And we thought, let's reinvent it in a way where we can answer questions and get a, um, a continuing storyline that can continue the saga for hopefully years to come. Well, I mean, I, I'd love to hear what, I mean, I, I do know this, but I'm sure everyone would love to hear what the impetus was to bring this back. Well, there was you and all of you. Yeah. And those questions you wanted answered and your passion for what this was. And the truth is we, we would have brought it back sooner, but there, there were some other issues that we don't need to go into. But So our, our hands were tied to a large degree. So we, we knew the fans were still out there. We, we hoped they were. And uh, when everything cleared up on our side, that's when we started reaching out and we saw the fan base was still there and you guys still wanted some more material and answers and whatnot. And that just got us totally jazzed and, and jumped right into it. So. And as creators, it's, it's an odd thing where, you know, the powers that be at NBC, we didn't know they were negotiating for the football thing. And at the same time, they were saying, leave it as a cliffhanger. You know, we were the number one show. So no one gets canceled through the number one show in your night. But they bought the football thing, so we had, we had all these cliffhangers purposely built in. And then when we did the movies for TNT, it was the same thing. It's like, we're gonna do 10 of these. Let's just plan it out how it's gonna go. And then 9-11 happened, and CNN lost all their money, and they didn't know what to do. And we're sitting here going like, well, wait a minute. We've, we've set the audience up in a way that's not fair. And we all know, I'm sure everyone in here is had a show they loved and it got canceled and you sit there and you go like, you know, all of a sudden I'm the, uh, I'm the girl left at the prom. I came with one guy and he left with someone else. And what happened? And our thought was, one, it's unfair. And because, as Craig was saying, we, we got lucky in our, the rights reverted back to us in a way that we can do this. So we thought, you know, the fans have always been loyal to us. Let's be loyal to them and continue this in a way that is satisfying because, one, because we can and we love the project really more than anything else. So I know you guys were really surprised at the insane amount of fans that are out there and 
and all over the world. So what what's what was the most did surprising thing about that? Did you say the same fans or the same amount? Insane fans <laughs> and an insane yeah, amount. We qualify as both. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think the world for me it was the the, the world, worldwide reach of the fan base. I mean, we have literally what what has been set up. The fans have set up these satellite centers all over the world: Russia, Australia, France, uh, Germany, Germany, Spain, Georgia. There's one in LA. And if you eight and nine now. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the fact that the reach was, so we always kind of knew that we had an international audience, but we weren't quite sure how international. And, and it's, it's amazing. Like we, we're Twittering and some people are in bed and they Twitter us back the next day because it's all over the, t the time map. So it, that was my biggest surprise. Right, and it's funny because we were writing the book and we said, I wonder if there's anybody out there. We were writing, you know, we're, on, we're on our second novel, we don't release the first one. And, about that time a lady named Vanya, um, and she's from Portugal, said, would you be willing to answer a few questions? And she said, we've interviewed you know, a couple of stars, and some of the stars that she'd interviewed were actually guest stars. And she just said, I'm taking a shot in the dark. And you know, I said, sure, I'd be happy to. In fact, we're launching some books. I, we're best friends. I talk to her two or three times almost every day, and there are you know, fans in everywhere from the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, which I didn't know was a Grand Duchy, but that has been pounded in my head, to literally Italy, France, Germany, uh, Russia. Who knew we had so many Russian fans? We've had a crazy amount of Russian fans. South America, Australia, there's a lady in Australia who's done, well, actually, this is taking you to an, uh, an affiliate site, which we put it on her site through our website just because she's a genius at coding and she just loved the show. And, you realize people have kept this thing alive, so we, you know we felt like we want to do that. But the insanity of the of that fan base globally is great, and which is I know the list of what it says here. We're reinventing um, fandom on a global level, and what we realize is we are. And part of the fun of what we're doing is everyone here is like our name of our website center. You should come check it out because within the website there's a lot of fun stuff that's not it's not just a website it's a big kind of a celebration of the community for all the fans but we're doing things where for instance we just started this um, like last month where we're sending out a newsletter but it's the center employees newsletter from the center itself and within it there are character things and whatnot and if you go on that newsletter it's in the site there's a, an announcement of a couple getting married well the couple actually is getting married they're in the books now, and it is fine. She got married, you know, two weeks ago, and we announced it in the thing. And she's in the books. And there's several fans that have written and said, hey, um, they've written, one lady from France wrote a letter one day and said, hey, can you, um, my friends and I were trying to argue about what Miss Parker's first name is. And I think it's this, and it starts with an M, and I think it's that. And, we, and she kind of wrote up what the argument was with her friends. I happened to be writing a chapter about then and I realized she had written it better than I had written the question. So I emailed her and said, hey, can I use your line and put it in the book because it's better than mine? And she was like, oh my God. And then I thought, well, can I use your name? And so I ended up, we made her a character in the book and her handle on Twitter was Chick with a Gun. So now she is the head of the gun range in the center. Thanks. And, and of course she's like, okay, sure. And we, you know, we put a picture up and on the website, and and what's interesting is like we've kind of integrated this fandom on a global level where there are clues within that uh, there's clues within that newsletter that are important in the next book, and people don't know that yet. Well, I guess they don't know that now. <laughs> but but the point is, everything we send and all the interaction coming back and forth really makes us a, a global community in a special way. We struggle. Like these guys look like they'd be good. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> we struggled for three months about the cover. Sitting in front of Photoshop, asking people why not, and lo and behold, one day we got this beautiful template, which is, it's if you look at it, it's kind of a cast iron Vitruvian man. We knew we wanted to feature Vitruvian man, and this design came from a woman Australia. named Kylie Lake from Australia. She's a fan. She's she said, I don't know if you can use this or if this will help, and it was it was brilliant. Yeah, and so what we did is we put a contest out for the fans and they could vote on the cover. Well, Kylie didn't know where we were going to use her thing, her art in one of the competitions, and no one knew it was from a fan, but when the fans all voted, they picked hers. 
you know, she's blown away. She lives in a, a village in Australia of 400 people, and she's like this celebrity now. <laughs> but it's great because she was such a fan, and we just wanted to integrate everybody together who showed so much love and compassion for the show and, and reverse it, and, and we turn that in a way where everyone can be involved. And it, it's funny because it kind of subconsciously came from our, our attitude about the series when we were doing the series because the philosophy always was the best idea wins. It doesn't matter if it's somebody working the craft, uh, craft food service or if it's one of the producers or an actor or whatever. If that was the best idea, that's what we went with. And, and we've always tried to, you know, I guess pay forward a little bit or push push people to push themselves to be creative and to contribute in, in ways even outside their their typical uh, jobs. And it's sort of it's sort of happened that way here with the book too, which is great. It's and we'll just say this now. I'll tell you who it is later. But there's three people in the show <laughs> who actually were in the show mm -hmm. in one episode or not. <laughs> When are you going to reveal that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we, we were talking a little bit, um, and you touched on this a bit, about the center universe and how it's sort of expanded. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the plans and where that's all going? For the center universe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the center universe, again, it kind of came out of, we wanted to do more than just the pretender, and we knew that the, the, uh, the pretender overlay had a lot of ten potential tentacles out there that we could could write new material and really try to bring new fans in at the same time. So what we've done is we, first of all, we want ideas from everybody who visits the site, pictures, ideas that they've had about the, the, the Pretender. And a lot of those ideas, we'll, we read them all and we say, you know, that's pretty cool. Maybe there's something there we can do you know, with that. And we actually, we actually answer all of our emails to everybody who writes us. We've done a couple other things that are interesting, and it ties to the universe. Um, we realize the center's vast, and it does a lot of other things. So we have a couple, like the the Young Miss Parker books, is part of the center universe because it's a different thing. The graphic novels are part of that center universe. Uh, next year, we're going to launch one or two other books that are tied in. One of which is written by someone in this room who was actually one of the writers on the show and was in the show. And it is about a guy who hunts serial killers who learned his trade from Jerry and basically does it as not as a pretender but as in one aspect of being a pretender and we realize there's so many different variations of where that can be that we wanted to bring that into the forefront um, so actually this guy over here is writing those books with us and he wrote several episodes of <laughs> Lord, 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 Lord. and if those of you who are, or if you're fans of the show remember when Little Miss Parker first was brought into the um, Sydney's lab because her mother committed suicide one night outside. Mark, who's a good friend of mine and was like my best friend in high school, happened to be on the set that day. This is before we started writing. And we needed someone to be the sweeper. And he goes, I'll do it. <laughs> and of course, in the middle of it, he gave himself a line, but which was not written because he wanted to actually say something. We didn't pay him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you still owe him money? Yes. <laughs> yeah, probably do. Yes. <laughs> All right, so um, as far as little, the, I want to mostly talk about fan questions because that's, that's right. getting answers is a really big deal. So what's the question you get asked the most besides Ms. Parker's first name? What happened to baby Parker? Uh, what's Sydney's last name? Which, yeah, Sydney's last name we're going to find out in the, next, in, this, in the second novel, so we can take that one off the list. And when, when are Jared and Ms. Parker going to be a couple? When are Jared and Miss Parker going to be a couple? That's uh, that's still on the <laughs> drawing board. It is. is. That's a that's a big move. You know, yeah. we've got to make sure that we've got that one. But there's a, there's but one one thing we are doing in the books is really exploring their emotional binds or connections to each other. Which you know, on, on the show you can you can see that and we can talk about it on a surface level. But in the books and in the um, graphic novels, we can really get into it. In well, I also wanted to ask you about the difference between writing something in novel form and writing for TV. So, um, what sort of challenges did you guys find? Um, to me, there was more positives than challenges because, as Steve said, you could really get into the characters' heads a lot more and and reveal things and explore things that you just never could on a TV series. And, and that's that's really rewarding when you can do that. And 
the, uh, it's funny because for me, the dialogue is the hardest thing to write in a novel, which in TV, that's, that's what drives it. Because I'm just, I'm so into, what are they thinking? What, what are their impressions of the people around them, the, the situation, the tension, and all that? And I, I think it's great fun. I, I really like that. Well, and there's things like, what is the thought process? One of the most difficult things about the TV show is you write um, scenes and whatnot of Jared coming into a situation. Well, you have a character who is not who he says he is and relating to people in a way that is not how he would relate. So you don't really learn anything about it. You know, the only way we learn about him is in those flashbacks or when he's talking to Miss Parker or Sydney because no one else knows who he is. But in this form, not only do we get to go into his head and we can see what makes him tick, we can see what makes him nervous, what makes him afraid in the middle of a pretend. Literally what his process is in, a, in creating a pretend and we went into it in great depth and for, for me in particular, I'm sure for uh, Craig as well, it was, it was territory we never explored. The, like what really goes on and what is he really thinking when he's you know, gonna slice a person's body open and, as, as a doctor and he's not really a doctor. That's pretty, uh, it was pretty intense and a, a really unique um, vision. And that's, again, I don't want to flavor the point, but it is the, that, that aspect of looking into those characters and finding out things about them allows us to answer all these vast questions that were posed. Because, you know, let's face it, we're all sitting there wondering, it's like, why does Miss Parker, why does she have this affection to Jared? Or why does she have this hatred to Jared? But when we can go into her story and flashback into her life, because in the TV show, we never flashed into her life from her point of view. We do it in all the characters now, and we can really see things about her life and what happened to her life and her relationship with her parents. And it's re it's really fun in that uh, way to fill in all those blanks. And how much, as you were writing it, how much did you know? So, like, if you come up with something, like, say, Baby Parker, how much of that of the the full story is in your head, and how much is just like, okay, this is a really cool idea, let's explore it. Yes. Yeah. Well, we <laughs> we, we we need to have the whole story um, flushed out. And that's and, and the rebirth and saving Luke are, are linked um, because we had there was just so much we wanted to tell and, and we just felt that was the best way to do it. So for the first two we had we had everything and now we're we're starting to we have general ideas about the books going forward of course because you want to have a direction just like we do with the series we kind of knew where season one was going to end and and two and three and four and we knew the overall story and the right. answers of where everything goes which always said is the answers in the mayonnaise jar. Um, so we know where we're going, but in a, in a series, you know where you're going, but you discover things along the way. You know, and one thing that Jim brought that really kind of blew us away is Ava Cronus was really kind of a nutball, and she was, in many ways, the anti Catherine Parker because she did some really weird things with the children. And our thought was the idea of, because we're going to really learn a lot more about Catherine Parker and her trying to save the kids in the center. And we thought this is a great counterpoint because everything Catherine did was so positive and and the connection, I don't want to say with the connection, but there's a physical connection within the center to the Perones that just is, you know, as we've, we've always done, you, you, we like to plant seeds and then they come back and, um, well, either tease you or haunt you later. But that was one that uh, is going to come out in these books and graphic novels that are just really encouraging. Well, yeah, and one of the first, uh, things that we had talked about with the, with the novel was doing something that surrounded the history of the center and, and we're really glad we didn't do that because of what uh, Jenna brought to the table. And when she started pitching the idea about what she wanted to do with the graphic novel, we, we looked at each other because it was like, this is better than what we were coming up with. And it was rich and it, it was tied to history, it was international, she, she nailed all the right points with what the center should be and what the origin should be. So, thank you. It's gonna be cool, it's gonna be very, very exciting. Okay. And the other thing is because of what we're doing there and what we're doing in the different novels, they're all interconnected, they all stand alone, but they're all interconnected with different stories that will give you richer backstory into the whole evolution of the center and everything pretended. So we're getting close, uh, we have about six or seven minutes left, so, or, or one. Or one. one. Let's wave at it. Let's wave at him back in. All right. So, are there any final questions before we wrap up? Have you got now that you're doing this, you know, rebirth and whatnot? Have you guys talked to any of the original actors? Michael oh yes. And Jan, how, how do they feel about it? Have they expressed interest in being involved? They're they're very excited. They're happy for us, and that the, the series or the the pretender is going to you know come back and is coming back. 
And we've had little talks about you know the future projects, and, and as Steve said, we want to build to some films, maybe another series. They're they're very excited. And who knows? We do the audio books. They might be the perfect people's voices to put on. We've told them that. <laughs> I think we should all tweet them. So listen, they're going to run us out of here. I want everybody to take one of these cards so you can download and look at the, uh, or download, you can go visit the um, 10 page. Yeah, check out the 10 page preview um, and make sure you go to the website, thepretenderlives.com. Yeah, it's on here. Um, and we're going to be down at our booth, which is 714. Come by, you know, we're going to be signing books and we'll answer any questions you have to continue this as much as you want. Cool. And then finally, Twitter handles. Oh, uh, I'm at Pretender Steve. I'm Craig Van Sickle. One, one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Jenna Bush, B U S C H, like the beer, not the president. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it.